I've got with me one of the most popular, if not the most popular personality in Los Angeles radio history. And his career goes way beyond radio. He's done cartoon voices, he's acted in many TV shows down through the years, and he's been the announcer and host on TV game shows. He's done it all. And I think everyone across the U.S. at some time or another has heard his voice. And he was the first person in TV history to really make me laugh out loud. That's when I was nine years old, and he was the announcer on Rowan and Martin's Laughing. And oh, that voice. I still remember it going something like this. And now the Laughing News has Richard Nixon buying cars, Henry Kissinger telling jokes to the stars, and Spiro Agnew planning a trip to Mars, or something <laughs> like that. Yes, Ladies and true. gentlemen, it's Gary Owens. And Gary, hey. it's great to talk to you. Bob, thank you very much. Nice to chat with you today. All right, very good. Now, you're certainly one of the supreme voice talents of all time, and also a very, very nice man who uh, spends time with people and talks to them. It's very much appreciated. I'd like to start here with your early life. Talk about your days growing up in South Dakota. Well, South Dakota is primarily a farm state. However, uh, there are a lot of people in TV and movies out here now. Uh, of course, Bob Barker is from South Dakota. Cheryl Ladd. Oh. Charlie's Angels. Oh, yes. Uh, Pat O'Brien. Sure. Mary Hart of Entertainment Tonight. Uh, so many who grew up in this wonderful farm state. And uh, so I, uh, while I was in high school, I was actually broadcasting at that time. How about and that? Now, were you making all the kids in your class laugh back then? Only because of the way I dressed. <laughs> yeah, I'd wear a funny suit. A duck suit to school. <laughs> no, I was uh, I was a cartoonist, the class cartoonist oh, at boy. that time. and uh, But I was actually in the business I wanted to be into starting at age 16. Well, how about that? Now, when you were uh, growing up in South Dakota, a question I have to ask, because this is one of the great uh, wonders of the world, they say, when did you see Mount Rushmore for the first time in your home state? Oh, probably 12, I guess. My folks used to go out to Mount Rushmore and the Black Hills. And... Uh, did you hear something you may not know? The original title for North by Northwest, the great Alfred Hitchcock film mm -hmm. starring Cary Grant, mm -hmm. was The Man in Lincoln's Nose. <laughs> that, was the, that was the working title for that movie. Oh, my gosh. And then the people with the film said, oh, no, that's <laughs> not too good. But anyway, Mount Rushmore was always wonderful. Gutson, Borglum. Uh, all the great sculptors who worked on that. I've been up there twice, and it really is something. And that whole Black Hills region in uh, southwestern South Dakota is really, really nice. Okay, I'd like to hear about your early radio career before coming out to the West Coast. I know that you worked in two cities where I spent my life uh, growing up in, those two cities being Omaha and St. Louis. You then went on later to Dallas and Houston. Talk about your uh, early radio days. Well, my early radio days were uh, as a newscaster. I was a newscaster when I came to Omaha, and the disc jockey on the air got mad at the owner of the station, Don Burden, and quit in the middle of the show. So only uh, the DJ, myself, and our chief engineer were there, so I had to take over, because the chief engineer didn't do on the air stuff. So then I became a disc jockey. I'd never been a disc jockey before. I'd always been a newscaster. And, of course, we had six turntables at KOIL, mm -hmm. a lavalier microphone, two Magna Corda recorders, <laughs> and I didn't know how to run any of them. <laughs> so we'd be like, and now here's Patience and Prudence from Coil, and going to get along without you. <laughs> uh. and, would be a, uh, and I would goose the record accidentally every time. So then I would just ad-lib about it. See, I had a background in jokes uh, from the time I was 12. Sure. I started as a cartoonist when I was 12 years old. How about that? I won an art scholarship from Charlie Schultz, who at that time was with Min Minneapolis Art Instruction in Minneapolis. And I won one of those draw me, win an art scholarship things. And he was the man who gave me the art scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I knew him most of my adult life as we went on. But I got that at the age of 12. Okay. So there's not much difference in doing a joke on radio or television or movies or uh, in a cartoon. There you go. It's just transposed. So I already would, was able to ad-lib on a number of things, and I had to because I was so bad technically as a disc jockey. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, no. where it went. Not you, not you. And I'm going to hit you with a couple of jokes here in just a little bit. You went from Omaha, then you went on to St. Louis, too. Uh, yes, I did. I, let's see, where did I go? And from Omaha to Denver, went from there to the McClendon stations, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and New Orleans. 
which was Gordon McClendon's father-in-law, James Noe, the governor of Louisiana, who owned WNOE. Sure. That's where I first worked with Elvis Presley oh. in 1957. What was that experience like, meeting oh, Elvis? Oh, it was great. It was great. Colonel Parker paid, uh, I don't know, about ten girls to break into the studio. <laughs> I mean, they didn't break in. They just opened the door and ripped our clothes during the interview. Oh, no. <laughs> Which was something. But uh, in retrospect, uh, yes, Omaha was my first beginning. Uh, that's uh, double entendre almost. Uh, that's being redundant. But that was the start of my radio career as a Josh Dickey. Now, say and uh, <laughs> uh, Todd Stores got me out of the city. Oh? He got me the job in Denver. Okay. He sent a tape of me to KIM in Denver, and that's when we went from Omaha to Denver. 95 Kim. Yeah. And then, uh, now you were at WIL in St. Louis, too, in the, in the late 50s when Jack Carney was there, right? Yes, Jack was the program director. I was the morning man. He was the afternoon man. Dick Clayton was there. Uh, Ed Bonner. Robert Osborne, Bob Osborne. Sure. A great staff. Absolutely. And St. Louis only had about eight radio stations at that time. A lot of program directors these days, um, you know, the way they want to do it is is to shut up and play the music. Say the song, say the artist, tell the temperature, give the time, say your name, and say something like, we play the best music and on to the next record. But back in the 60s, I know when you were working at KFWB and a lot of the other radio stations in L.A., then like KRLA and KHJ, a lot of personalities. Oh, yes, very much so. Well, the great thing is, you could do whatever you wanted. You would give the time, the temperature, the weather, whatever you needed to do, traffic. But in the same time, uh, for example, I would have a live commercial every day for Dr. Pepper and another live one for Pepsi-Cola. And uh, just to make it different, I would, of course, say, well, I'm going to get inside this bottle, this glass bottle, that contains Pepsi-Cola today. Well, here I am. I'm going to be the entire show from the inside. <laughs> it's a little wet, but it's a little water. Oh, that's Those great. Kind of a thing. And uh, so you could add personality to whatever you were doing. And I would have characters like Earl C. Festoon, which was a bumbling old guy. Oh. Earl C. Festoon here. Oh. Which way am I facing, Garnish? Oh. Well, it's Garish, actually, is my nickname. <laughs> uh, and you'd go from there, and I would have Clinton S. Femish tap dance to the weather forecast. So every time I would have a guest, whether it was Elvis Presley or Henry Mancini or Dolly Parton or whoever it might be, oh uh, I would have them tap dance to the weather forecast. <laughs> I had an old Fred Astaire tap dance record that I would use with the actual tap dancing. And well, it's going to be partly sunny today. It looks like a high of about 72 degrees in Los Angeles. And... Uh, so it had a lot of things to it. Oh, that's fun. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have you do some of your quotes uh, more a little bit later. Now, that, of course, led you, after your um, getting into radio in L.A., that, of course, led you into other voice work, uh, which included cartoon voices and roles on TV shows, including an episode of The Munsters in the mid-1960s. I still remember it. Fred Gwynn, of course, was playing the part of Herman Munster, and he came up with the song, My toe bone's connected to my foot bone, <laughs> yes. my ankle bone's connected to my... Knee, bone, blah, 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 or whatever it was. And, it, and anyway, you were playing the part of a disc jockey on there by the name of Dick Willett. How about that Munster's experience? Well, it was interesting. The uh, casting director at Universal for many, many shows was Joe Rich, R-E-I-C-H, who mm -hmm. now works with Disney. And he was so good. He was a big radio fan of mine. And he loved everything I did. So he would put me in the Munster's of just about every show at Universal that was going on. Blondie. Uh, all these kind of shows. And Jack Benny, the there Jack Benny show. Absolutely. I played Jack Benny's uh, secretary's boyfriend. How about that? And uh, it was interesting when we were doing that Munsters episode, Bob Hope dropped by Universal that morning and came into the dressing room when we were being made up. Of course, it would take Fred Gwynn maybe four hours to get oh, into that makeup. I can't imagine that. And Yvonne DiCarlo doing the same thing. Sure. And, of course, Yvonne has that ghostly white makeup on. Right. And the red lips and so on. Right. And Bob comes into the dressing room and he says, Yvonne, you'd better get into makeup soon because you're going to be on, on screen. <laughs> oh, my. She'd been in makeup for three hours. Oh, my gosh. And, that, uh, that's amazing. Uh, so that was my first meeting. No, actually, my first meeting of Bob Hope. His manager was Jimmy Saffir, uh, who was a marvelous agent. And Jimmy wanted me to be part of his voiceover group for his agency. In other words... I would do commercials for his agency, and then he would get 10% of my money. That's, mm -hmm. that's the going rate. And so to impress me, we went to lunch at the Brown Derby with Bob Hope. Mm. And I said, Mr. Hope, uh, now this is my first meeting of him, uh, Mr. Hope, 
What's the quickest way to become a millionaire? Oh. Knowing full well that he was more than that. Yeah. And he said, well, I'll tell you, young man, I'll tell you. Buy real estate. I can tell you in one sentence. Oh. Buy real estate. Oh, my. And how right he was. Oh. Specifically for Los Angeles, California. Right. Because you could buy a home in the 60s for $100,000 that was a mansion that is today worth $3 million I the believe same it. home. Now, is this a, are you talking homes close to the ocean or just... No, no, these are any place in yeah. L.A. Uh, How about that? Bob lived in the valley, not far from where we're broadcasting right. today. Which in is right Toluca in Toluca Lake. Lake. Yes. Okay. Uh, he had a giant mansion on Moore Park. And, of course, Dolores still lives there. He's a wonderful, beautiful wife. Now, and other TV shows came along for you, including I Dream of Jeannie. And I can remember when you were actually on that show, I think, including even Barbara Eden playing the part as Jeannie, they were, like, imitating you, putting their uh, hand over the oh, uh, yes. ear and, and, and everything like that. that, that I well, bet that the, was amazing. The episode was interesting. George Schlatter, uh, the creator of Laugh-In and the producer of Laugh-In, and I uh, played ourselves oh. in I Dream of Jeannie. And Jeannie uh, wants to come and visit Laugh-In. She wants to dance on Laugh-In, in the dance party scene. And uh, so she shows up while we're in a clothing store in Florida. And uh, she magically appears and wants, asks me how she can get on Laugh-In. Oh. So I introduce her to George Schlatter, and she comes out to beautiful downtown Burbank, oh. which is a phrase that I created. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so we did the whole show. It was great fun with Bill Daly and the whole gang. Uh, on I Dream of Jeannie. What a crew they had Arnie there. Arnie Johnson, Judy Karn, and oh. I uh, were on the show. You know, one of the things I, I, I'm sure uh, over, the, over the years, Gary, is that when uh, people talk to you, you know, they can't help sometimes but imitate you. I, I can remember um, a broadcast name I know you know out of Chicago, Jack Brickhouse, longtime Cubs announcer, uh, used to sit next to a broadcaster when they would announce a game, and the announcer would say, He's out, you know, right. and and Brickhouse couldn't couldn't help but imitating him, and I think that's kind of the same way with you. When people do talk to you and uh, get to know you, they sometimes probably can't help but imitating you. Oh, I remember when I went to Chicago, I was fourteen years old for the first time, and I met <laughs> Jack Brickhouse, and then I would always say, you know, that girl is built like a Jack Brickhouse. Oh, <laughs> how about that? Okay, then along came the show that would really make you and your voice famous, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Now, how did all this come about for you? Well, it came about in the most interesting way. Uh, I had a company with Mel Blank for 20 years, and I recorded with Mel maybe three times a week for 24 years. And he was the most magnificent cartoon voice of all time. Bugs Bunny, Porky Pig, Tasmanian Devil, Daffy Duck, Sylvester and Tweety Pie, Speedy Gonzalez, all of these great characters. And so uh, I had worked with him all these 20 years. Well, in the meantime, Laugh-In begins in 1968. Artie Johnson was hired first for Laugh-In. And uh, because Artie and I were buddies, we would record frequently with Mel, Artie recommended me as being the in-betweener, Rowan and Martin, and the rest of the cast. So uh, Dan and Dick would do a monologue, or, you know, they would do dialogue together. And... Uh, I would suddenly come in and say, Meanwhile, in a seemingly deserted warehouse, somewhere in the Creebly district of Burbank, we hear Lyle Fetner say, and then whoever would come on next, Goldie Hahn, Lily Tomlin, uh, Joanne Worley, Ruth Buzzy, oh. Artie Johnson, Henry Gibson, uh, Johnny Brown. You know, so that's the way it would work. Can they you do a, a, a no, the Laugh-In News, if, if you could do one of those real quick? <laughs> Time for Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In News, ladies and gentlemen, but first this important fact. The Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, does not contain one bit of Eiffel. True or false? How about that? Hey, now listen, how did you come up with that hand-over-your-ear uh, style? That came about when I was hired by George Schlatter and Ed Friendly and Rowan and Martin. <clears throat> we were going... Uh, their offices were right across the street from the Smokehouse Restaurant. And that's where Wink Martindale and I later discovered the Captain and Tennille. Oh! And we discovered them there. You bet. And uh, got them on uh, major label A&M Records. But uh, that same place, George and I were going to lunch. Now, we were typing jokes for Laugh-In next door and with typewriters. Now, you know, computers weren't what they are today. Right. So we would have little purple creeblies on our hands and we had to go wash up so george and i went into the men's bathroom and the, the ceiling is acoustic tile 
in the ceiling there mm -hmm. in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. So I just did a thing where I put my hand over my ear and I said, my, the acoustics are good in here. You know, that kind <laughs> oh, of my thing. gosh. And George says, hey, that's what I want you to do. There you go. I said, and, what, and you want works. me to wash my hands? He said, no, no, I mean, you'll be, you be an announcer, like a 1940s announcer, where they would always put their hand over their ear uh, because that's the only way they could hear an orchestra behind them. Oh, you I know, see. From the beautiful Krellman Ballroom high atop the Finster Building in downtown Dayton, Ohio, time for Joe Banana and his bunch. How about that? So that's what I what I did. There you go, George and it says, obviously I works. I want you to be on every show, and you will be the in-betweener between the cast and Rowan and Martin. How about that? So I, you know, I would be on the show any number of times. Now, when did you develop that phrase, beautiful downtown Burbank? Well, it started on my radio show at KFWB. When I was the morning man there, I would always have some alliteration, uh, you know, alliteration as far as the weather forecast. Well, here's the forecast today for magnificent Monrovia, uh, romantic Reseda, <laughs> and beautiful downtown Burbank. Oh, there you go. The beautiful downtown was used so many times by every dance band announcer. When I was a teenager, I used to work for Mutual, the Mutual Broadcasting System, and I would do dance band remotes from uh, Mitchell, South Dakota. Uh, where I was going to school at that time. And uh, uh, while I would do these things, uh, they didn't want to send a big-time announcer out, so I was the local newscaster and announcer guy in that city. And so I would do a dance band remote with Stan Kenton and his orchestra, Freddie Martin. Uh, Merv Griffin started as a singer.